Hey everyone, welcome to Sum Zero. Uh, today we've got something a little different from our uh, traditional talk on stocks. Um, I'm here with Professor George Church uh, and Ben Lamb, co-founders of Colossal, uh, to talk about something that's, I think, pretty mind-blowing, uh, the topic of de-extinction and bringing back the woolly mammoth, which um, I remember when I saw um, the news headlines on this, I just like had to take a minute um, just to process what, what all this even meant. Um, so, uh, George and Ben, gr great to have you um, join us. George, you're, you're a professor at Harvard um, and have been sort of a genomics, uh, a leader in, in, the, in the genomic field for quite a long time now. Um, and Ben, you're a serial, serial entrepreneur, and, and I think it's so awesome that you guys connected to, to solve, you know, one of the, the more important problems in the world today. And maybe, um, you know, when we look at the next hundred years, like this might be, um, one of the, you know, maybe the most important um, initiative, uh, just given all the climate problems that, that we're facing now. Um, can, can one of you just kind of give the quick, um, just to start things off, the quick um, high level on why de-extinction matters and, and just um, uh, you know, what, the, what the connection is between de-extinction uh, and the environment, just so people can understand uh, where you guys are going? Well, well I would say that uh, we're really looking for uh, in, in increase in diversity in endangered species. And then the possible contribution that either that diversity or those keystone species can make on endangered environments or, or environments, yes, that have already gone past the brink. Uh, and so the, the one we're talking about here is, um, not just de-extincting genes, just genes, not species, but those genes, we give, give us a reach all the way around the world and back in time a million years. So there were elephants, elephant-like species, mammoth-like species all over the world uh, uh, at one point or another, except for Antarctica and Australia. So um, that gives us a huge diversity but our diversity is not limited to extinct genes. So it's not, so de-extinction is about genes, but we can also get genes, for example, that, that uh, change their behavioral, dietary, or virus or pathogen resistance. And we were looking into all of those. Got it. Um, and, and why the woolly mammoth is, uh, maybe walk us through that. Like, how did you choose, of all of the mammals to, to bring back, <laughs> why was the woolly mammoth uh, the focus? Well, we're mainly interested in technology that can be used by our group and other groups for varieties of endangered species. And there are no shortage, unfortunately, of such things. Uh, the mammoth got the highest priority. Uh, first of all, it was the first one that anybody inquired about to us in 2006. Um, and, but as we dug into all the options uh, in, in collaboration with reviveandrestore.org, we, uh, they made a long list and there's, they're still working on many species, um, but this one seemed like the, the, the one that was most likely to make an impact on both currently sequestered carbon and re-sequestering uh, carbon so we can get back closer to industrial levels. And that was absolutely mission critical because of all the methane that's been released from uh, the Siberian, Canadian and Alaskan um, Arctic regions. So from, from what I at least read uh, on your, on your website, the, the idea is that as this, as the woolly mammoth sort of, you know, raises on, in the tundra, it exposes, is it grass that somehow um, is better at capturing carbon emission than, than say trees would be or uh, a little. It shifts, shifts on this, but, the balance back back to what it was a few thousand years ago from trees more to grass it's not an either or just yeah. dramatically back to grass the grass was much more uh that ecosystem had many more species including many more large herbivores that would keep the the trees from growing above the grass keep the grass trim and uh would help build up a layer a new layer of grass uh, leaves and roots every year that you could freeze and, and, and there's no going back, kept building up. And so that's why there's more carbon in, in the Arctic where you wouldn't necessarily think there's a pot of carbon than there is than all the rainforests will put together. Uh, and so, so that was uh, 
the, the, the keystone species of approach. Um, what's your timeline on this? So, um, so our goal, you know, Arctic rewilding is going to take, you know, obviously, you know, some time because elephants, you know, have to get to a certain age before they can be effective at, at, uh, uh modifying their environments and, and knocking down trees. But our goals for our first calves is four to six years, but like any engineering project, um, you know, that time, those timelines can slip. Those are, those are the timelines that we've set kind of internally. Uh, but our investors have been pretty supportive on, you know, if there's slippage, you know, it's about getting the science and getting the technology right and also getting the mammoths ready for mass production uh, of Arctic elephants um, so that they can actually make the impact we're looking for. That's really, you know, kind of our focus. So so with that, our, our initial goal is four to six years for our first calves, which we feel is aggressive. But, you know, that's what we're currently aiming for. And, and just on the science and technology um there's so much talk right now about, about you know, CRISPR and, and just how it's going to impact the world. Um, you know, I've seen people talk, I mean, I've heard that they're close to figuring out a cure for sickle cell anemia and, you know, and other kind of mononucleal diseases. Um, like how complicated is the sort of leap from, you know, editing an elephant's gene uh, sequence to creating the woolly mammoth? Like, how much of a difference is there genetically between the woolly well, mammoth and well, remember and we're we're really creating arctic elephants so we're not trying to take and rewrite a mammoth from scratch we're really combining genes and modifying genes in an asian elephant um cell line and so we're not actually remember we're creating arctic elephants so they're going to um exude the uh phenotypes and kind of physical attributes that make them cold tolerant like the small ears and the shaggy coat and the cold tolerant hemoglobin we're not trying to write a, a mammoth from scratch. We're, we're really kind of leveraging both, uh, both the Asian elephant cell lines and then uh, the mammoth genes. And, and you know, George has done a lot of work in, in pigs that he can talk about that you know, kind of help de-risk and very, very similar to, to what um, we're, we're working to achieve here. Yeah, and, and, uh, and it's really about, we want these to be uh, saving uh, the endangered elephants, Asian and African. Uh, so it's not uh, not recreating mammoth, at least not right away. Uh, it's about the endangered species, and we have de-risked it, as Ben said. With a, uh, you know, you ask what can CRISPR do? Well, CRISPR is already in clinical trials for uh, human uh, mutations, uh, but it's also moving. It's in preclinical trials uh, for organ transplants from pigs that have been edited at 42 sites in their genome, or depends on the strain. Um, but we've published on, on one that is 42 size. Those are healthy pigs, healthy enough that they can donate organs to non-human primates. And that's going on in three hospitals in the United States. So CRISPR is having an impact both on uh, genetic diseases and on all the diseases that require organ transplants, which include infectious diseases, uh, age-related diseases, and so forth. So it's a very broad set of things that are already in preclinical or clinical trials for CRISPR. And and that makes it, the elephant experiment much, much easier knowing that, that all of that uh, is moving forward and having that funding that supported us very generously um, for human applications now can be used for veterinary and endangered species and species conservation. Yeah, when you modify the, the genome of a, an Asian elephant um, to make it cold tolerant, which is, I mean, is the end result something that looks pretty much exactly like a woolly mammoth or is it something in between the Asian elephant and the woolly mammoth? It, it's not our goal to make it look exactly, but it probably will look exactly. Um, one, uh, one difference, like I said, we're not limited to the mammoth genes. We, there are existing alleles in elephant populations that makes the tufts uh, very short or very long. And so we might have uh, different uh, breeds, different strains. They're all be, they will all be Asian elephants or African elephants. They'll be the same species, but they will have either short or long tusks, depending on how much we can ensure that they're protected from poachers. Um, so if we can't protect them from poachers, then there is evidence in, in the wild that they can protect themselves and just not growing tusks. Um, so that's, that's an example of something that is not from the mammoths and would not look like mammoths, but would be in their best interests. Uh, in our in everybody's best interest, probably. How hard is it to uh, 
to control the gene for size. I, I just imagine these woolly mammoths. I think I saw something on your website that the tusk is five meters long. I mean, or, you know, and then the height is like, what was it like 11 feet or something for a... Uh, so, uh, so the the ancient elephants range up to 22 tons. Uh, typical elephants today and typical mammoths were more in the four ton range. Uh, or, or oh, they shrunk, okay. <laughs> Well, it's not that they shrunk, it's that there were many different solutions to the problem. And in fact, there are elephants as little as 0.3 tons uh, on the island of Crete. So there's this big range from 0.3 to 22, and we will explore it depending on the, the needs of the, of the species that we're trying to save and the needs of the environments we're trying to save. Um, but but I, 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 don't, I don't think, so. to answer your question about size, it is one of the easier things to manipulate uh, growth rate and final uh, size. So uh, there are many experiments and many animals yeah. where you can make them smaller or larger, typically with somatotropin or some other uh, hormone like that. And uh, uh, the classic one that is now out and uh, approved for uh, use in the wild is the, the, the aqua bounty salmon, which doesn't get bigger, but it gets big faster it gets twice as fast um, uh -huh. uh, 18 rather than 36 months to full maturity but there are plenty of things where you'll have dwarf mice you'll have uh, uh obese mice you'll have all, all uh you'll, you 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 have and just look at humans and dogs you can see like um uh, many hundredfold uh difference in in size between the smallest dog and the largest so these are relatively yeah, many... easy traits uh very often in humans, just a single gene is sufficient, which is a, the human growth hormone. Yeah. What, how many woolly mammoths do you guys think we would need to make a dent on carbon capture and, and to, to really, you know, make a measurable difference in, in climate? Are we talking about tens of thousands or? or uh... We are talking about tens of thousands and, we've, and, and uh, we're doing modeling to, to see how we can optimize this, find places that are, are the richest in carbon. So we want to protect those uh, from thawing uh, and, and grow grass there to make more carbon. Um, and also places that are the lowest, close to zero human population density. So we're, we're working on, uh, we're working with a number of teams that are excited about modeling this and making maps and, uh, and so forth. So I, I think uh, we can make a pretty serious dent in it because this is probably, there's more methane being released and more opportunities for carbon being pulled out of the air in the Arctic than the, than the whole rest of humanity put together. It is just a very big problem and a very big opportunity in the Arctic that no matter how many SUVs we don't use and, and lights we turn off, it's not going to be nearly as big an impact. Um, how much colder would you expect the Arctic to get if uh, you succeed at this? Well, this will be up to international uh, discussion. We're, we're just providing the tools. Um, I think there is some interest in getting us back to closer to pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide and temperature. Uh, partly because we, we may not have that much choice because there's this positive feedback loop where methane gets released and that methane is somewhere between 20 and 80 times worse than carbon dioxide, depending on how you calculate it. Um, that methane is getting released and then it heats up more and more methane gets, and there's just a huge amount of methane in all the karst lakes uh, scattered throughout uh, the Arctic. Um, and, and, and all the non-lake land has similar levels of methane being released. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, something that hopefully we can get a global agreement on because it shouldn't involve much belt tightening. Obviously there'll be winners and losers whether the temperature goes up or down, uh, you know, but, but nevertheless, it wouldn't be the first time that, that, that uh, we tried to get some international agreement on something that was mostly in the benefit of everyone. You know, for example, Disarming uh, probably hurt the, the arms manufacturers or the hydrogen bomb manufacturers, but it helped most of us, I think. Yeah. What now? Uh, what What would you say would the, the connection be between, um, you know, let's say, an increase of the permafrost layer and just um, sea levels, and just kind of keeping them at bay for you know folks who live in areas that are 
uh, close to the water. Ben, you you want to you yeah, yeah. So I mean, our, look, there's many technologies. Like, th there's only one. There's only really one way to to truly solve climate change, and it's changing the hearts and minds of the entire world and consumer behavior, right? And so, there's many tools in this tap in, in kind of this tapestry of technologies that that need to come together. While I think that there's interesting ripple effects that could occur from Arctic rewilding and keeping the permafrost uh, frozen, we're focused on our little our piece, right? Like it, you know, ultimately it's about, um, you know, uh, cooling and, and keeping the permafrost frozen and suppressing uh, methane, you know, which George mentioned could be uh, 30, 30 X or more uh, worse in, in, in the environment and then in the atmosphere. And then secondly, it's about, you know, leveraging these technologies for thoughtful disruptive uh, conservation. How do we put, you know, elephants which are endangered through giving them genetic uh, tools of their uh, ancestors back in their industrial domain where there's where they can not just be helping us with Arctic rewilding, but they can also be, you know, preserving the elephant lineage by putting them in a low dens density location where there's not a lot of human and elephant conflict. Um, and so so we, we're really focused on kind of those two aspects of, of our project in, in ensuring that that methane suppression uh, is, is kind of the focus. You know, there's many other people that are working on many things ranging from green tech to fusion to, to solar to, to you know, various types of other renewables like ocean that sh that should continue. We're, we're, we're by all, you know, by all means, we are not just the solution to this. We just want to be one of these solutions to a couple of the uh, uh, problem states that, that are affected by, by um, uh, climate change. And so we haven't done extensive modeling uh, to that degree on, on what kind of the ripple effects you know, could be, we're really focused on what has to be achieved in a what event horizon with how many Arctic elephants to really suppress uh, uh, the methane. Yeah. Can you describe the womb that you'd use for um, a, a woolly mammoth? Is, is this, would you use an, an Asian elephant surrogate, surrogate or is this somehow bred in a lab? This might sound like a dumb question. But <laughs> where's the woolly mammoth going to be born? Well, we're parallel. We're, par we're we're parallel pathing two paths. One is a, a surrogacy path, and one is an artificial womb path. Our our goal, and George and I are pretty aligned on this. We we really want to see artificial wombs for a myriad of reasons. One is because we don't want to, um, and most important, we don't want to uh, affect existing elephants and, and try not to to use them for surrogacy. Um, at, at the same time, we think there's massive uh, ripple applications that could be used with the artificial wombs um, over time uh, with other endangered species like the northern white rhinos and, and, and others that may not have the de-extinction tag on them, but are critically endangered and, and, and need support with gestational technologies. Um, George, do you want to chime in any more on, the, on either? Yeah, I mean, for surrogates, that this, this would be just to uh, get early feedback uh, and might be as little as, as one or two African and or Asian elephants. Uh, they're, they're both endangered. We, we did uh, the pig experiments on, on many different strains of pig. We could do it, uh, this experiment on, on at least two different, uh, two or two to four species of elephants. Just to drill down a little bit on the womb technology. Um, I've never seen an artificial womb, but I, I feel like I've seen this in like Hollywood and. You know, but do you guys manufacture the womb itself or would, would you guys, would Colossal manufacture the artificial womb? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's the plan, right? You know, and, and there's been various, you know, there's been lots of great work that's been published, you know, like later stage artificial wombs with bio bags. There's been um, uh, ex vivo work done with mice. There's been a lot, you know, it's, what's interesting is that, you know, people sometimes think it's a, a long ways out or it's, it's crazy science fiction, but science fiction a lot of times you know, paves the way for our future. It does a good roadmap in some ways, right? A lot of times is we, we see that. I think the first time that I saw, you know, the, the, the two um, uh, return rockets for SpaceX, I was like, this is right out of a movie. And I think a lot of people, you know, felt that um, uh, way as well. So I think that, that science fiction does a lot of times pave the way for the future, both good and bad. Um, fr from an artificial womb perspective, you know, our intention is we're working on uh, a couple of interesting and novel approaches that we think could be successful. Um, and we were collaborating with a lot of folks that have had various levels of success at different stages 
uh, of uh, mammalian development in um, in artificial or, or synthetic limbs. And so um, our long-term goal is to actually manufacture uh, those artificial wombs. You know, my, my background is, is, as you as you know, is in, in um, molecular biology or or genetics. I, I'm more about building teams and hardware and software. And so um, this is an, an area that I think that you know we we have the right kind of skills around the table uh, for mass production long term. And, and I should point out that Ben's last project involved bioreactors. So uh, it's not that far away, really. Yeah, yeah which you... which we were which. On a side note, George, I don't even know if, you know if I sent it to you. If not, I'll send it to you. But we were, uh, the Smithsonian was kind enough to put us in the um, uh, futures exhibit, which is which is really cool. Wow. So that's that's for a, that's for a, a photo bioreactor, but a lot of a lot of the same issues about keeping things uh, sterile and 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 healthy, alive, and yeah. yeah. So so George, like when you release a genetically engineered, you know, animal into the wild. You know, and I, I can imagine this, especially if it's coming out of a, an artificial womb. Um, like, is it uh, instinctually wired to survive in the wild without, you know, parents that are guiding it? Or, I mean, how, how does that, how do they learn in that, in that sort of, they just get thrown in there, thrown, thrown in the wild, and what do they do in that what? Well, and just to be clear, that that's not our intent. You know, okay. elephants are very social elephants. You know, they're they're in you know eight to hundred elephant you know herds and pods, and so you know, elephants are very very social. And they're and and you know while some of that is you know programmed in their in their DNA, they do learn a lot for from their their parents. We're we're working really closely with conservation groups and and folks like Ian Douglas Hamilton, who's one of the top elephant researchers and um, rescuers in the world. He runs and founded Save the Elephants, which is the largest uh, orphan elephant and, and elephant support uh, group in the world as it relates to, to elephant rewilding and whatnot. And so for us, you know, we're leaning heavily on kind of experts in the field and, and veterinary experts that work with rewilding of, of, of existing elephants and also with abandoned elephants and with, with calves that got abandoned due to predators or poaching or or or, or just loss or, or separation from, from the herd. And so just like some of the work that you may have seen with sock puppets with the California condor, you know, you've got to still work with the animals and, and build up behavioral training models, which we are, you know, while we're a ways away from that, um, you know, we're already starting um, both the research and some of the plans, um, you know, for that. Because our intention is not just to birth our first calves, put them in the, the Arctic and, and wish them well, um, our goal is to have a, a very thoughtful approach to, to rewilding. Is is there a predator for? I mean, other than man, I guess um, <laughs> for the woolly mammoth. There, there, uh, there is. There may or may not be. I, I mean, it, uh, it, it's. Uh, I'm not sure how essential it is. At least at the beginning, if it is essential, they can be introduced just as they were in Yellowstone. The wolves were were introduced. Uh, after a 70 year hiatus. Um, yeah, there's plenty of examples of rewilding uh, of major herbivores. For example, the, the bison had shrunk to, to just uh, hundreds of bison, mostly in, protect, in protect, protected areas. Now there's 500,000 bison, half a million worldwide. Uh, and so the process of rewilding is done in in hundreds of species all over the world. It's, it's, and, and I think most of those have turned out well when they're intentionally rewilding in modern days. Um, there are some older examples that didn't go well, um, but they weren't really rewilding. They were more uh, introducing an invasive species without uh, knowing uh, what the consequence would be. So uh, these, these, this, this will be much more like uh, the rewilding model we hope. What are the next um, animals in line? Like, what, what's in the queue for so, high priority? We, we get, the extinction. We, we get that question a lot, and everyone apparently has their favorite animal. Uh, we've been flooded with different responses, but you know, we're myopically focused on um, uh, on on our Arctic elephants to start. But as George mentioned, talking about earlier on, talking talking about both the traits that we can go back uh, in time and also go across the world, we, we 
uh, across the full globe, we have a lot of optionality with what we can do. Um, you know, for us, we're really focused not just on the elephants and, and saving the elephants and in, in, in archery wilding with our Arctic elephants, but looking at other species that could be um, uh, helpful in that. You know, one of the ones that we're, we're doing some early research on is uh, uh, the Sumatran rhino and seeing how we can apply those technolo some of our technologies to genetic rescue of the Sumatran rhino that could then lend itself because it's the closest phylogenetic relative to the woolly rhino to a woolly rhino project. But, but right now we're focused on, you know, one, the, uh, our Arctic elephants, and then two, we're focused on really ensuring that what technologies we have, we could then apply to other existing um, megafauna. Um, we are doing some interesting kind of early computational bio, uh, computational research on, on other, other species, but it really kind of also needs to fit back with our goals of, of Arctic um, rewilding. Ben, can you talk to? I just, to I just, I just quickly want to add to that 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 we're working with Pleistocene Park uh, in northern Siberia, where they have already done an experiment on about nine species of uh, rewilding. These are not genetically engineered, but they don't need to be. They could, in principle, follow behind the, the roaming uh, ele Arctic elephants and become the major herbivores, uh, just as they were. Um, thousands of years ago in the grasslands of the Arctic. So, so we are interested in that kind of rewilding, but it, even if it doesn't involve uh, in, uh, genetic engineering, since they're already cold adapted. Speaking of herbivores, is, is that the preferred type of mammal to bring back? Is there, is there an advantage to a vegetarian, you know, <laughs> roaming? Well, I think, it's, I, I think it's less scary. Um, you know, That's true. We, yeah. did, we did also we did, we necessary did not... to keep the trees in check. Uh, yeah. the, the, the bison and the horses and the uh, elk and caribou, so they cannot uh, uh, change it back from trees to grass or shift that ratio, but they can maintain it once it's there. And that's been uh, demonstrated in a Pleistocene Park experiment. Uh, they've done a really terrific job, the Zimov team, uh, at, at, at demonstrating that and also measuring the carbon dioxide and methane released from the ground as a, a consequence of these uh, herbivores once you get rid of the trees. Got it. Um, ben, can you talk about just the capital required to get you to the point of, you know, that first calf? Um, like what, what is the, uh, just the, the sort of, what sort of resources are necessary over the next, if, if you have a four to six year time frame, even if it's 10 years, whatever the number is, um, what do you guys need to kind of, you know, pirate. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great it's a great question because remember we're not only focused on the Arctic elephants, we're focusing on the the technologies both from a genetic engineering and from a uh, software and hardware perspective. Um, you know, being with artificial wombs and, and even some wetware that uh, that can also have mass applications to other veterinary medicine, to other species, and even human healthcare. And so it's it's not just about focusing on 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 that. A lot of the a lot of these innovations come out of, you know, of the, the um, uh, Mammoth Project, but but ultimately, you know, our, our Series Seed, which we announced, which is sixteen and a half million dollars, gets us pretty far. Um, you know, that's we've entered into a partnership, um, not just with our team, but also with Harvard, and we have postdocs working in in George's lab um, underneath George, plus uh, kind of our 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 um, uh, external lab that's working really really closely. So we feel really confident that you know our current round of funding. We'll get us past um, uh, viable embryos and, and 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 close to calves. Like any private startup, you know, as we make technology advancements, both from a milestones on on you know our mammoths and on um, on the technologies themselves, on the technologies that get derived from the project, you know, we'll raise additional rounds of capital. And so um, we have we've been very very lucky to have you know Thomas Tall and the Winkle Boss and. And and Jim Breyer and and some of these uh, folks like like Tim Draper that are really long term focused that care about the impact that we're making that care about the technologies that come out of this long term and and we have very very patient capital so I think that you know we have the right investors around the table um, not just to support us through the seed but um, on in subsequent rounds that you know we'll definitely need at some point and are, I'm just curious how you um, connected with. This, this particular investor group was, I mean, I don't know if George, you had dealt with any of these guys in the past or Ben, if you had 
like I know Tim Draper is involved. Like, did, are these guys you knew in the past or kind of? Uh, so I knew some of them. I knew I knew some of them. And then, you know, I, I it was a combination of folks that I've, you know, because this is my sixth technology company that I've that I've founded and ran uh, in, in addition to other ones I've been involved with. And um, so I knew some of them pretty well. And then, um, and then, you know, I just spent a lot of time, you know, talking with George and others, thinking about who are the right types of targets. And, you know, we were pretty selective with who we went out to. We didn't go to a big road show in the Valley. We didn't, we were very, very thoughtful, you know, in, in the approach, you know, I'm, I'm kind of shocked. We kept it as quiet as we did pre-launch um, because it was a pretty, pretty large launch that I think everyone, at least a large percentage of the world saw. Um, and so I, I was pretty thankful that, that, you know, that, that kind of thoughtful approach to fundraising probably helped us in keeping, you know, the, the genie in the bottle as long as we could. Um, but yeah, I'd say it was a mix of uh, folks that half of them have, I've worked with and collaborated with before and, and, and others that, um, you know, we targeted um, given just kind of their interest and, and long-term nature. Have you guys thought about the economic model for the business itself? And, and just in a broad strokes, what, what would you say, you know, is um, the model that you're targeting? Well, there's, there's a tremendous, it, it's pretty varied, right? Because we have both the animals themselves that we think could be massively helpful in carbon sequestration. And there's an entire um, uh, uh, blossoming uh, carbon sequestration market that we think could be um, quite huge. Um, you know, that's further off. So we're not as, we don't talk about that as much in, in investor presentations quite yet because some of the numbers are, are staggering what we think the impact, um, you know, could be and then and obviously what the, the um, economics could look like for us in that. In addition to that, you know, you know, we're, we're looking at monetizing the individual technologies that, that come out of this. You know, everyone, we, we like to think of um, our project as akin to like the, the Apollo program, right? Whereas more technologies came out of Apollo than Tang. Everyone, when I bring this example up, I've had numerous people who are like, well, Tang came out of Apollo. So Tang did come out, but so did you know GPS and fundamental internet technologies that allow us to communicate today that, that are highly monetizable. Technologies like artificial wombs and multiplex editing tools and, and other uh, wetware and software, we think would be pretty helpful for both veterinary medicine and, and human genomics. Um, uh, and so we'll probably shorter term, we'll be monetizing and uh, looking to monetize some of those technologies. Longer term, we really focus on um, uh, some of the, uh, the carbon credits and in carbon cycle work. So like on the, on the carbon credit stuff, like in theory, you could sell that to like foreign GM, right? Or, or car companies that need for regulatory reasons to meet certain emission credit thresholds. It's a, it's a correct. It's a byproduct, but you know, our, our byproduct is we could sell the credits and, 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 and monetize pretty well. Um, you know, but our, our primary focus is just, you know, we've, is, is ensuring that the Arctic doesn't melt and, and we release really yeah. all the methane. So it, 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 for us, it's a win-win, right? Because from an economic perspective, it looks pretty interesting. Early models are pretty interesting um, outside of, uh, from, an econ from a return perspective, outside of the, um, you know, the, 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 the true benefit to, to humanity that you know, is probably unmeasurable. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you, you guys are attacking like one of the world's greatest problems. So there's, there's going to be ways to make that sustainable for, for the business, obviously. Um, who else is doing this? Is there, I mean, is, is there, are there other companies that are kind of peer, peers of yours or um, companies that you trade research notes with? Um, or, or, well, it's a great question. We're, we're very, very collaborative. So we, you know, we believe in radical transparency. So we want, you know, governments, other cor corporations, nonprofits, conservation groups, um, you know, uh, even individuals. So we, we we're pretty vocal with the with the world population, and we, we want to hear you know feedback and collaboration. And, and and then other we've had kind of a flooding of, of incredible top tier scientists. Uh, George and I were trading emails last night, and we were talking about how lucky we were about how many people are coming to help us since launch, which is incredible. I mean, we I sent him some Arctic. Um, some uh, some Arctic maps that um, an, an incredible uh, uh, collaborator uh, created for us, showing you know that as George mentioned, that more densely located populations are, are pockets of of carbon and methane. Doing and just doing this research and just wanting to help and support. And so we've been very very lucky with kind of this like you know just onslaught of support that 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 um, uh, that we've had. And so to our knowledge, there's there's no company out there that's focused on. 
uh, de-extinction and then lever and then monetizing the gestational and genetic technologies that come from that. Uh, there have been other groups out there from a pure uh, academic perspective that have worked on man uh, on, on mammoth restoration, um, um, but I, I don't you think guys can hire them nearly as far as as, as this. But but we're excited. We're excited about collaborating with everyone, and so you know we're we're very transparent and very collaborative. And you know yeah. George and I both are big open source believers, and um, you know have had a history of doing that. Is the majority of the team in the Cambridge area at this point, as far as the it, research? It, it's combined. We have core biology happening um, at, at, in the Cambridge area, some at Harvard, some at our independent lab that's, you know, in conjunction with Harvard. Uh, we have uh, um, some work being done on artificial wombs and um, in, in secondary species and other work happening in Dallas, Texas. Um, and then we have uh, some core software happening in a, com a combination between Dallas and Austin, Texas. So kind of our three little um, hubs are Boston, Dallas, and Austin uh, these days. Now, do you guys have to develop software itself for the advancement of this cause? So, so we don't have to de develop software necessarily to advance it, but I think there's, there's positive ramifications from the development uh, of this software. So we are looking at some of the intersections between um, some of the work that, that's being done in the lab and software, but it, it's still... It's still early, um, so we're, we'll probably start talking about some of our ideas around it in 2022. Yeah, so I mean, as far, and then as far as the hardware, you had mentioned this earlier, um, are you guys developing hardware as well? Or were you referring to the artificial womb itself as, as hardware? I'm assuming well, you are. Artificial, artificial wombs will be, you know, at scale, I mean, I think you, you asked this and, and, and George answered, you know, at scale, we want tens of thousands of mammoths, right? And so, there's more than just artificial wombs that goes into that. There's full, you know, almost production level facilities and, and robotics and whatnot. That's, I think that the same uh, level of, of engineering and innovation that will go through um, the training and development um, as well uh, at, at, at scale. If you look at like the sock puppets with the California condor, how do you use robotics and, and other things? So I think we've got a lot of really interesting long-term engineering innovation opportunities ahead of us. Um, but, but ultimately our, our core hardware initiatives right now are around artificial wounds, but I think that's just the start. Uh, what's, would you say at this point is your bit, biggest roadblock or challenge, um, in terms of getting to that first calf? Well, there's uh, no real sign, oh, George, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, Ben was about to say that it's mostly engineering. I think, uh, the, for the first calf, which may be via surrogate, uh, that takes off the table one of the uh, riskier things, riskier bits of science engineering, which is the uh, development of a vascularized endometrium into which the embryos can implant. But we have published on ways of doing that. Um, but if we use a surrogate uh, African or Asian elephant, uh, then that, that reduces that risk. Um, the, the, the pigs have shown that we can do multiplex editing uh, fairly effectively and, and then get them into uh, breeding populations. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, that almost everything is well balanced and we're trying to do as much as possible in parallel. Uh, so there's little problems all the way along, um, but rather than doing them in series, we're doing them in parallel and hopefully that will uh, cut down on the timeline. Um, I mean, it sounds like from your, at least the tone of this, that you guys see this as an inevitable, as an inevitability, like this is going to happen. Um, whether it happens in four years or 10 years or six years or whatever is, is, is up in the air, but it doesn't sound like there's, um, we want, I, I don't, I, I don't like phrasing technology as inevitable. It needs to have this always needs discussion. We want to provide some of the basic tools and the proof of concepts so that the discussion can go to, we've been discussing this since 2006. It's not like we're springing it on anybody, but we want to, each time we develop a new tool, we want to have, say, well, what do, what do people think about this particular, that it's a lot of it's in the details and we really want them to visualize the whole process and help us think in advance all the things that, that could go wrong, either for the animals, the environment, for individual peoples, uh, and so on. So, uh, but the, the, the more graphic 
nicely illustrated we can make it uh, with, you know, with actual working inventions. Um, even negative um, uh, graphics, you know, like Jurassic Park, helps us avoid the negatives in the future. It's, it, we shouldn't downplay the negatives. We need to address them. Yeah, we learn. Uh, we learn. Next? We learn more. We learn more from the negative comments than than the positive comments, right? You know, we're as I mentioned, we're really focused on radical transparency, and so we're we're going to continue to put everything out there as we make reach reach major milestones. And then, you know, the positive feedback's great, and, and the support that we're getting is incredible, as George and I have talked about. But then, even when one person has a negative comment or, or thought, we want to hear that because that can help inform, you know, our, our decisions because we don't want to miss anything. And, and you know, we're not going to get everything right, but we're going to do our best. And I think that the, the best way to ensure we do everything mostly right is to really listen, you know, to the world and to the community. Um, just to, to kind of wrap things up, what, what, what are, what's maybe the next main or big catalyst for the rest of us to maybe look out for uh, to just kind of track uh, your progress. I mean, is there something that so between so, now and you know when we start, uh, yeah, we, it's, it's, it, it's we won't we won't come back to you in four to six years. I think that you know as I as I've, I hopefully mentioned enough on this call, you know we want to be radically transparent. And so as we're making, you know, we, we're in the process of of standing up several additional labs right now in, in, in hiring and in whatnot. But we'll be publishing some great work on the Arctic rewilding efforts. I think we'll be showing some of the, the um, you know, some of the things that, that have, have come out that are amazing, like AlphaFold 2 and, and, and some of these other technologies that allows you to, to, to really make some protein structures and genes and, and why not really real for people. You know, we're going to take people on that journey with us. And so um, I think you'll see a lot of, of contents continue to come out from us around, you know, different genes that we're de extincting along the way progress on the artificial wombs, progress on other con on other tangential uh, conservation projects that we're uh, working on right now. So, so we'll continue to keep people um, pretty informed, um, you know, as we, as we go down this path, it, it will, it won't just be some big reveal and some <laughs> mysterious timeline in the future. Well, well, listen guys, um, you know, thank you for taking the time out. And, and as I mentioned to Ben, when we first connected, um, I'm, I'm rooting for you guys. And it sounds like a lot of other people are as well. Um, so no, I, I'm definitely going to be, um, uh, you know, looking out for whatever you guys put out next, whenever that is. Um, but thanks again for taking the time and, and congratulations on all the, all the work you've done. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate much. you having us. Yeah.